Hello, everyone, and welcome to SCORE Fairfield County's live webinar on how to develop business plan, a business plan in six easy steps. I'm Tim Ryan, the webinar coordinator and a business mentor here at SCORE Fairfield County. I'll be your host today, and our presenter is John Harmon. More on John in just a minute. First, some brief info on SCORE. We are the volunteer partner of the Small Business Administration, so all our services are free. We offer three primary value-added services to small business owners. First, free one-on-one -on -one counseling. Second, educational workshops and webinars like this one, over 100 per year. And three, we have extensive resources on our website, including templates to help you build your business plan. We also have a large number of recorded webinars on our website that cover a wide range of business topics. These can be viewed at any time by clicking on the on-demand uh, section of our website. Some useful info about today's event. We have set aside time for Q&A at the end of the presentation. If you have a question, please use the chat button at any time during the presentation. It's located in the lower part of your screen. Our webinar will end sharply at 1 p.m. to respect your time. The session is being recorded and the link to the recording will be available at fairfieldcounty.score.org within the next day or so. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker. John Harmon is a SCORE volunteer. He is Managing Director of Agilent Consulting Services, which advises small and medium-sized businesses on strategies for growth and operating excellence. I'll now turn it over to John. John, it's all yours. Well, Tim, thank you very much. And uh, thank you all for joining on uh, just the beginning of summer. Um, so uh, this, presentation will cover a business plan. Uh, I should tell you at the start that there may be uh, parts of this, is, this plan that pertain to you and no other part, uh, in, in which case focus on that part that makes most sense and uh, you don't have to worry about the rest. Uh, or you might find that uh, in, in focusing on that first part, it leads you to other parts. So this this is meant not necessarily as a step one through six process so much as pick your step and move on from there. Um, so we're going to talk about what a business plan is. Um, we're going to talk about the actual steps themselves. And we're going to talk about tools that you can use to evaluate your progress, both in putting the plan together, number one, and in implementing number two. <clears throat> and we'll talk about a closing challenge. <clears throat> so um, a business plan consists of several pieces. The first is to set sales and earning targets. Now, I know for those of you just starting out of business, you may see this as uh, a waste of time since you really don't know what you're going to when you're going to sell things and how you're going to position them. But it's, it's good to at least start because it's a good exercise to think more deeply about what you're actually selling, more deeply about how you might want to position it, and more deeply about uh, how you might want to go about it. And we'll talk more about how to do that, but that's the first step. <clears throat> Once having done this, there's going to be assumptions that you have behind setting these sales and earnings targets. An assumption might be uh, well, I don't think I'm going to sell much in the first couple of months because I'll just get started. Or I think that um, my main channel of distribution will be the internet, and I can expect this kind of response from the internet. Um, the assumptions are all over the place, and usually they're wrong when you start out with. But that's okay. You got to start someplace, and you'll find that in making a guess and proving it wrong will lead you to a better guess and a better outcome. So um, think about the assumptions that are behind your sales and earnings targets. And, and then you start thinking about, well, what am I going to do in order to achieve these targets? Who's going to do it? And for most of you starting out a business, it's you. When does it occur? And at what cost? And I will tell you that one of the big challenges to a business starting out is helping to manage costs down. Um, it's important that you spend only the amount of money you need to spend 
and no more. Sometimes that's a tricky decision to make, but it's important that you try to manage your costs. And then we'll talk about uh, monthly metrics. Uh, how, how do you figure out where you are and where you want to go? And here are the six steps. Uh, we're going to talk about analyzing your market and your business. It may be easier for some than others. We'll talk more about how tricky it can get. Uh, what's your marketing position? We'll talk more, more about what that really means. And then we'll start talking about the sales and earnings goals, which is to say applying numbers to your business. Uh, again, hard to start with, a lot of guesswork, but if you start with one guess, you're going to lead to a better outcome, if, even if you're wrong. Uh, we'll talk about an action plan uh, and then several key financial statements that every business needs to be uh, comfortable with. P&L, cash flow. Uh, we won't talk too much about a balance sheet, although I can discuss it in, uh, in a, at a high level. But those are the three financial statements that are key to running any business. So uh, what am I going to do first? Well, I'm going to collect data. I'm going to collect an understanding of the market I'm trying to serve. Um, the first is market size. And, and maybe this is not that important for many of you. Uh, but it may also, you may also determine, well, what's the geography of the market? Is it going to be a city in Fairfield County? Is it going to be all of Fairfield County? Is it going to be all of Connecticut? Is it going to be New England? Um, but defining the market size, the geographical area that you're going to be serving is an important part of focusing in on what your business is going to be about. Uh, it's important that you have some idea of growth. Now, it's okay if the market is not growing. <clears throat> so uh, in many businesses, in what I'll call mature industries, and let's just say an example of that might be uh, accounting services. Accounting services are, are a mature market. There's probably a lot of people offering accounting services, in which case your growth factor is going to be taking share as opposed to growing the entire market. But however you choose that, it's important that you understand what the growth potential is and what the implications are for your business. Uh, also, market segments. We'll talk more about market se segments in a few slides, so I'll, I'll let it go at that. Uh, what, what are the drivers? What kinds of things do your customers use to determine uh, what they buy and how much they buy? Is it quality? Is it cost, service, or what are those things? Again, we'll get more into details on this. But it's important you identify what the, those are. And as in any business plan, it's important that you document this. Uh, demographics, we'll talk more about it in the next slide. Uh, competitors, um, some of you or some of the clients I've, I've uh, uh, had tell me that there are no competitors. Well, there are always competitors. So let's be serious about who they are and let's learn from them. Don't ignore them, but, it, but learn from them learn from them, and we'll talk more about how that works in a few slides. Uh, distribution channels, uh, all this is saying is what, what are the means of my communicating with my customers? How do they know I exist? Why, do they, why would they buy from me? And how am I going to deliver this service? It could be in person. It could be over the internet. It could be through a brick and mortar store. It could be anything. But those are channels of both communicating with your customers, convincing them to buy from you, and then delivering that service. Uh, seasonality, regionality are, are, are parts of most businesses. Landscaping, as an example, is essentially a, a summer business. But who knows? Uh, you might repurpose yourself into snow removal. So a lot of it depends on seasonality and how you position your business with respect to whatever the season is. And then key marketing drivers, these are, these are things that may change over time. Uh, taste may change. So as an example, if I'm in the clothing business, it may be that I as a certain style that is in now, but may, may not be in later. So understanding what those, those factors are will help you identify what your market characteristics are. For each one of these areas, there's a source of data, 
Uh, the internet is obviously one of them. Um, one of the things that I suggest to clients is that they use the internet to do market research around things like uh, 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 different kinds of, of, of quality, um, the messages that are typically delivered by competitors. There's a number of things you can learn from the internet. I'll give you more examples as we go for forward. Um, there are public company reports. These are probably more uh, of interest as a, a description of an industry as opposed to your particular business. Most public company reports are from large companies. Most of our clients are small businesses, but contained in those company reports are descriptions of the market and of the characteristics of that market that might be useful for you. Uh, every library has a business library, and there are many good ones in Fairfield County. There's also something called the Risk Management Association Reference Guide. It's in most of the libraries in Fairfield County. It is a big, thick book of all of the businesses in all the industries in the United States, and it contains data regarding uh, revenue size, profitability, asset structure, liabilities for these different kinds of businesses of different sizes. Why would I be interested in this? It gives you an idea of what the profit potential is and, and what, the, uh, what the balance sheet items are for your particular business to give you an idea of where you're, where you're going and what is considered to be a high performing business and what is considered to be a low performing business. Probably not of use when you're first starting out, but something you should keep in mind as you go forward. Um, there are government websites. Uh, the, uh, the Department of the Census is one of them. That gives you a, uh, the uh, North American Industrial Commercial uh, Code, which will identify the number of your business and industry. It's a Census Bureau uh, coding that allows you to identify the name or names of a particular business in a particular industry. Uh, trade association and shows are another source, data source, trade publications. All of these sources are available. They're easy to use and they're essential. Um, many of the small business clients I advise, I suggest that before they start doing things, they start doing some market research. And we'll talk more about what that means in a few slides. Um, competitors. Everybody's got competitors. You just need to know who they are and what they are saying about their service. So who are the customers of these competitors? They may, may not be entirely yours, but some subset of them might be. What product ranges and features do they offer? Gives you an idea of what your product set ought to be or what it shouldn't be. Uh, what's price? What's quality? All those things you can do by simply uh, going on using a search engine and keying in pizza shops or whatever it is you're in business to do. And it, use a variety of terms. If you're in, say, uh, the retail jewelry business, obviously you want to say you, you want to key in jewelry stores. You may want to key in diamonds or opals. You may want to key in uh, costume jewelry. You may want to key in a number of, of search criteria that will give you different hits to give you an understanding of what uh, competitors are out there. And like the market analysis, the data sources are uh, the same, roughly the same. Um, one of the things that you could do, particularly if you are in a consumer business that are that where the businesses are, are easy to visit, Visit a store if you're in clothing or if you're in jewelry or if what, whatever you're trying to do, there may be a brick and mortar store, a location you can visit, a restaurant. You can visit, pretend you're a customer, look at the menu, look at what the uh, items are in the store, look at how they're priced, look at where they're located. Um, and you can even ask the store owner or whoever's in charge of the store at the time more about the store, pretending you're a customer. You can learn a lot that way. So all of these data sources are available to you. 
All these are critical questions you need to ask yourself as you begin putting your business together. Um, this is a tool that is, uh, I'll say, co-opted from large company usage. Um, so in large companies, you've got a whole uh, list of, part of uh, departments, uh, which really don't know what other departments are doing. But as a group, if you all brought them together, they would bring together the common wisdom of the organization. Um, this tool is used at that point. You can use it if you are a small business, but I would advise you to uh, think about two things. First of all, if you're going to answer these questions, do it as honestly as you can with as much data as you, as you can. And second of all, if you can do it with somebody else, it makes it even better. So what is it? Uh, we're talking about your business looked at through two vectors. One is uh, internal. What, what is your, how do you view your business internally? What are its strengths? What are its weaknesses? And externally, from outside your business, what are the opportunities existing outside your business? And what are your threats? And it's just a matter of going through each one of these boxes and brainstorming as many things as you can that would describe your strengths or your weaknesses. And then once you have this list, identify the ones that are most important or most easy to answer and focus on those things. So as an example, if uh, I have, uh, if I think that my product offering is like a lot of others. Question is, well, maybe my strength is that I have excellent service, which is to say, I show up on time. I do what I say I'm going to do. Uh, I make you happy about doing it. And if you have a call or questions, I respond immediately, as an example. Uh, I may also have uh, few customers, in which case the focus will be on getting new customers. Going through each one of these boxes will allow you to identify some of the things that you need to work on in your business that are most important to work on now. You could very well return to this tool in six months or 12 months and have different answers. Uh, but again, I would urge you, if you're going to do it by yourself, do it honestly. Don't make it up and try to do it as much as you can with facts. So uh, as an example, if you think your your product is high quality, well, how do you measure that? How do you know it's high quality? Is it because you think so, or is it because there is some standard by which you can measure that quality? But just, just be honest, and that honesty is going to serve you well as you use this tool. So this is the first step, filling out this grid. Um, um, just march through each one of these items. Do the best you can. This will be the start of your positioning. This will be a part of understanding your, the market you're trying to serve. So that's step one. And by the way, most small businesses will, will spend a lot of time on step one before ever moving to step two. Step, step two is much more around a marketing position. Um, and this is an old uh, acronym called the five P's. It's, it, but it's still it's still relevant. The question is, how, how do I describe my product and how do I describe its position in the marketplace? So the first one is positioning. What's, who's your target audience? Who are your competitors? And why are you good at what you do? Uh, product and service. This may seem straightforward, uh, but I find particularly with service industries, it may be hard to describe in a way that's meaningful to your target market. So let's take an example of a personal service. Uh, say your, your service is going to be health. Uh, well, what does that mean? Does that mean physical health? Does, they, does that mean mental health? Does that mean physical comfort? Does that mean uh, that you're going to get big and strong? Or what, what does that mean? And who's the market? And, and, and uh, and with, say, a more business-oriented service, if I'm in the consulting business and I'm going to consult a business, what, what exactly what am I trying to help the business with? Is it going to be market strategy? 
Is it going to be supply chain excellence? Am I good, for instance, at uh, selling to uh, international customers or, or what? Um, that will help you describe with some specificity what your service is. Uh, because if the customers don't get what your service is, your marketing is just not going to be effective. Pricing is probably the most difficult thing that any company can do, not just startups, but companies that have been around. How do I price my product or service in a way for us to be profitable, number one, and draw demand without losing money that we otherwise could by having a higher price? I find that many small businesses start out by advertising low price as a way to get customers. And yeah, they'll get customers. They'll also get the wrong kind of customers that are unprofitable and it's a loser. So don't be afraid to price with some kind of premium in a way that's going to help you make money and also position you for future uh, sales. Uh, place. We already talked about distribution channels, geography, and then promotion. And sometimes people see marketing as just this promotion, but it's not. It's much more as we've described in previous slides. Uh, so uh, this is an area that we identified in the first slide or so, uh, and that's market segmentation. Uh, every business, even if they offer the same kind of products or service, have different sets of customers that may need the same service, but may use it in a slightly different way. Uh, so how you characterize those segments may be by the kind of product they're interested in. It may be more demographic in terms of age or income, but in one way or another, you'll have to identify the segments that you are trying to serve. The reason for that is because some segments may be easier to serve at first, uh, and so some segments may be more profitable later on, but are not easy to serve first. It could be that some segments have a great growth potential, others don't. Um, and, 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 and so you have a strategy of how you're going to serve a particular segment at a particular time with a particular message. Uh, Geography, we've already talked about. What are the benefits to uh, the service? Um, part of establishing your offer is going to be describing in a ways that make it attractive. That is not just what you do, but what happens to a customer when they use it. Does it make them feel better? Does it make them? Does it make life easier? Or what is it, what's the outcome that you're hoping your customers will enjoy in using your product or service? Uh, there's a lifestyle issue. Uh, my favorite example of that is cars. So if I, uh, if, if I am a Kia driver, I'm looking at certain kinds of things I'm expecting from my vehicle, lower price, maybe easier to maintenance, uh, whatever. Uh, however, if I am a BMW customer, I'm going to be interested in all those good things about the operation of the car, plus whatever uh, advantage it gives me in, in others' view of me. Uh, it may, I, I may feel better about myself in driving a, a Mercedes or a BMW and, and willing to pay for it. So lifestyle decisions are part of how you want to position your, uh, your product. And psychographics is really the psychological, emotional uh, uh, motivation behind the product, the the the, uh, the decisions your customers make. We already touched on that with the BMW versus Kia example. Uh, and then finally, what industries are a, a part of your market? Uh, are you selling to consumers? Are you selling to businesses? Are these businesses retail organizations, wholesale organizations? Are you selling through the internet? How are you doing that? So all of these details you need to think about as you begin putting together your marketing plan. Uh, and finally, of course, what makes your, why, why do you expect customers to spend money on your product or service as opposed to somebody else's? 
And there's a lot of reasons for it, a lot of, of, of justification. We often think of quality, yes. Price, I would urge you not to think about price as an initial uh, a, a attraction to your product or service. But service is clearly one. And I, I, I describe service as anything that touches the customer. That's not just delivering product on time. It's not just have, being available on the phone or through the e internet if they have a question. It may be something as, something as simple as billing or uh, any questions around payment or whatever. Uh, it, you want to make sure that if service is an important part of your, of your offer, that any way you touch the customer is going to be of high quality, fast, and efficient. So all of these things come into uh, understanding how your business is different and how you want to position that business with respect to your competition. Um, I, I like to think, that, but this is, by the way, customer, this is for businesses that have customers, but I like to think of customers of being a certain kind. Uh, one are growth customers. These are customers who have, a, a, because of the market or because of the type of business they're in, they are growing. It could be if you're in the consulting business that your growth customers are ones that start out with a small project and end up with an ongoing retaining relationship that, that increases in size and therefore economic value to you. Uh, it could be customers that you can't get until you have an initial customer or initial brand or performance characteristic that you've been able to prove in the marketplace. Um, those are so-called bread and butter customers. These are customers who you've been, been e e able to find easily that are satisfied with what you offer. They may not be a, a growth opportunity, but they're a great way to start your business. And there may be a stepping stone to uh, your growth customers. And there are also potentially uh, other customers that can fill in gaps uh, for the seasons. I mentioned landscaping as an example. Um, clothing could be another. Uh, there are a, a variety of seasonality aspects to all your businesses and what are they and how do you market yourself with respect to those. Uh, there's also undesirable customers. And unfortunately for those who are just starting out, it's hard to know who they are uh, because you don't know. Um, but they're, they're out there. And your job is to, if, if they're obvious to begin with, avoid them. Uh, an un undesirable customer may be one who wants continually demands lower and lower prices or demands much more service or demands much more in the way of products that you're offering that, and they want it for free. So uh, you don't want these customers. As a matter of fact, you want these customers to go to your competitors. It's identifying who they are and then making sure that you, you either avoid them or begin using uh, a process to re relieve yourself of these customers. Uh, that's a whole seminar in itself, but still it's important that you understand that there are undesirable customers and how you can avoid them. So here's, here's your, uh, your form on marketing, your targets, your competitors, your competitive advantages. You fill this out, and you have a much better idea of how to begin. These first several uh, steps are critical for a new business. Uh, for people in business, it could be that you want to pick and choose something that you would like to understand better or something you haven't done as completely as you could have. So you may want to pick and choose, cherry pick some of these questions out of these first couple of slides for businesses currently in place. But for new businesses, it's important that you do them all. Now, I should say that the business plan that we've been talking about does not have to be a leather-bound, library-ready book. As a matter of fact, it can be written on legal paper. Uh, it, it, it's important that you document it. It doesn't make any difference how you document it, but that you do so. And as you do so, begin uh, acting on your plan and also modifying the plan accordingly. It, 
it, the only reason you're going to need some formal business plan is if you're seeking money. If you're going to a bank, they're going to want to see something fairly formalized and laid out. Uh, on the SCORE website, you're going to see a lot of tools, a lot of guides for how you put together a standard business plan. Uh, this presentation is doesn't necessarily have to follow that formalized version of building a business plan. Just know that it's there and it's ready when you are. So here we are. We've done your marketing, your business analysis, your marketing position, and now we're going to go go through the tough task of figuring out, well, what am I going to sell and when am I going to sell it? And again, you're going to be wrong when you start out. Just know that it's a learning exercise and don't be afraid to start. So uh, here's uh, what amounts to a format for forecasting your future business. And even, uh, even businesses in business right now who've been around for a while, can use this as a tool to project out what your future looks like. So what are you gonna do? You're gonna lay it out on a particular grid month by month, and you're gonna guess, well, how many things am I gonna sell? Am I, how many widgets or how many jobs am I gonna sell? How many hours of my service am I, am I gonna sell? Make sure that you have an understanding of the unit of sales, whatever it is, and then you price out that unit whether it's a per item widget, whether it's a per case uh, uh, price, uh, whether it's a project price, just make sure you understand what that looks like. Now you may, again, these are guesses and you may want to adjust price according to the, cus the customer and to the opportunity. So when you're first starting out, you may very well, well want to have something called an introductory price that you're willing to give in return for the customer's acceptance of the risk of doing business with somebody they don't know. Uh, but once you've proven yourself and you always tell the customer, look, this is an introductory price. I'm going to do this once. If you like, if you like it, here's the price ongoing. But don't, don't, be, uh, don't be coerced into maintaining a lower price than you should. And then the frequency, how often do these units occur? at what price. And you simply go through the, the grid and you say, okay, for uh, February, I believe I'm gonna have a project and this project is going to be say an initial evaluation. And I'm gonna charge, if I've, I figure it's gonna be five days of work and I'm gonna, I'm gonna charge uh, $500 a day. And therefore uh, this project is gonna be worth $2,500. Uh, just count it out. and. And you can always adjust it. This is, this is nothing more than guesswork. And it's cheap in the sense that it's, it's a guess on a spreadsheet. It's easy to do. So once you've identified sales, then you have to identify the costs associated with that. And there's going to be two kinds of costs. One is the cost of directly delivering your service to the customer. And that usually comes down to labor in the form of hours and materials and shipping. Now, some of you in the services business may not have inventory, in which case you're not shipping anything. Uh, and you may have no materials, but you're gonna have uh, hours. But in one way or another, you wanna, for every transaction, you're gonna have a cost for the, that transaction and it's gonna come down to hours and materials. That's a direct cost. That's a, uh, it's called cost of sales or cost of goods sold. And once you subtract the cost of goods sold or the cost of sales from your revenues, you come up with something called a direct margin or a gross margin. That is uh, the profitability of the delivery of your service. It doesn't, co doesn't cover rent, it doesn't cover utilities, it doesn't cover marketing, it doesn't cover any costs that you can't identify with a particular transaction. And those are the indirect costs we're talking about. So you lay this out on a sheet, you do the best you can. You may start with a lot of uncertainty. There's gonna be assumptions behind each one of these numbers that you need to document. And as the assumptions change, the numbers change. Um, now score, 
uh, uh, mentors can help you with this. Uh, we have lots of experience to help you define some of these things. So you don't have to do it alone. And I should say something I should have said uh, initially, and that is, this is a, uh, this is the six, six steps to a, a business plan, but you don't do this by yourself. You're gonna need help. And that's why SCORE offers counseling after a seminar like this, so you can use the tools that you've been introduced to. So that's your sales and earnings goals. Um, for the first year, I wouldn't try to do it any more than a, a calendar year and do it month by month. For the second year, you might want to do it on a quarter by quarter basis based on some of the numbers you came up in the first year. Uh, but whatever, but because uh, the further you go out, the less certain you are about the vitality and truth of your assumptions. You want to try to be a little more general about how you define sales activity within a particular time frame. So that's step three. Uh, uh, by the way, uh, you could be in business for five years, but never have never have a forecast. Try it out and see if forecasting can help you better manage your business, understanding your costs, and being able to predict the ups and the downs of your business as they occur over time. Um, by the way, I see a Q&A here. I'm happy to answer questions at the end of this. So if you don't mind, keep the question in hand and we'll talk about it at the end. I'm, I'm getting toward the end, so <laughs> have patience. Okay, this is an action list. So once I have uh, I've identified my plan, the question is what do I do? And who do I do it with? And most importantly, what are the costs? You want to try to keep your costs as low as possible. Uh, I won't get into too much detail on this, except it's important that you have some, some kind of an action plan that you document. Uh, and there are other things that you need to worry about. Uh, and it will become more apparent as, you're, as you open and begin operating your business. It's things like, well, how do you sell better? Uh, what, what's your supply chain look like? His, how's my quality control? Is it consistent? Do I, if, if, if what I'm offering now is the same as what I'm offering six months, I want to make sure there's consistency and how do I know that? Office space, retail, all, all that stuff. And finally, the use of technology. I find that some small businesses start out doing a lot of things manually, as you would expect, because you're trying to keep costs low and you don't have a great deal of demand to satisfy. But over time, you may very want will try to find um, technology that can help you. A good example might be inventory systems, inventory systems that are connected to your accounting system. You may want to do that on the back of a paper bag if you want, or on a spreadsheet of some kind, but over time, you're going to want to have automated systems that allow you to manage this much better. So that's the action plan. Uh, there's a PN, we talked a little bit about the PL and cash flow. This is an example of a PL, and this is a pretty standard format. So at the top, you're going to have gross sales, and I would urge you to, to identify sales by transaction and price and size so that you know how many things go into gross revenues. Then you have your cost of goods sold. We already talked about that. That's the cost of directly delivering your product and service to the customer, materials, labor, shipping. And from that, you derive your gross profit. Uh, generally, and you can get this through the RMA, generally gross profits hover in the area of 50%. Uh, and that suggests that your operating expenses are going to be in the area of 30 to 35% because you're going to want a before tax profit of 15 to 20%. Now, you're not going to achieve that when you first start out, but that's the goal. And so if you construct your P&L based on these numbers and identify what looks to be a good gross profit, what looks to be a good operating profit, um, and if it's not, you can figure out, well, how am I going to get there? It may be that the best thing I can do is to change suppliers to a lower cost supplier. Or it could be that uh, I, I, I'm not going to have uh, an office. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to open a virtual office. Um, or I'm, I'm going to uh, uh, reduce my marketing costs or whatever. But all these things go into determining a, uh, a, a, an ideal operating 
income for the point of time your business is in operation. And then there's the cash flow statement. Now, cash flow is different from P&L. In some cases, it's not. Uh, when, it, when it's not different, when a cash flow is not different from P&L, it's when you get cash immediately upon uh, delivering your product or service. Good example is the restaurant business or the laundry business. Usually you get paid immediately, in which case cash flow is no different from your P&L. However, when you are in a business where you're invoicing customers and you don't get paid for initially doing the job, you want to make sure that you chart when you actually receive the cash. Um, and I, by the way, I recommend you uh, you having you uh, constructing your P and L based on the the time of transaction, as opposed to when you receive the cash. Uh, and the cash flow statement is, is much like a checkbook. So you're going to start out with cash on hand. You're going to figure out what cash comes in in the form of uh, of sales or receivables. And this is actual cash. This is not the uh, the service that you're delivering. And then you chart the pay, the cash you're paying out. And at the end, you're going to have ca uh, pay, uh, cash in hand. So if I start with $1,000 and uh, I have uh, $2,000 in cash, that'll be $3,000 in total. If I have $3,000 in expenses, that means at the end of the month, I'm going to have $0 in cash. Th this is important. Because if you are estimating that certain months you're going to have negative cash, that is, after all your business is done, you're going to have uh, uh, cash you're going to owe somebody. The question is, where does that cash come from? Does it come from uh, mortgaging your house? Does it come from your Aunt Nellie? Does it come from the bank? Or what is it? you got to have some idea how you're going to ca cover your cash requirements over time. And doing a cash flow statement helps you understand when you anticipate needing cash, how much it is, when you need it. Um, so that's it. Those are the six steps. Pick your steps, do them all, whatever. And I would suggest and urge you to refer to your SCORE mentor to help you with the details of how you construct this. Um, so that's about all I have to say. This leaves, Tim, I think that's the right time. This leaves 15 minutes for questions and answers. That's fine, John, thanks a lot. Uh, so we'll now use the remaining time for a Q&A. Uh, we'll take as many as we can up to one o'clock. So please submit them via the chat button at the lower portion of your screen. Uh, generally speaking, we don't distribute copies of the slides. They're considered the presenter's intellectual property, I guess. But uh, we will send a link to this uh, recorded webinar to everybody. You can watch it as many times as you want, pause it, uh, screen, take screenshots, whatever you can do. Um, so let's see, do we have any questions yet? Uh, first, uh, how can I, let's see. Uh, Cynthia, let's see, how can I schedule a meeting with a SCORE mentor? Um, if you go to our uh, website, which is fairfieldcounty.score.org, there's a find uh, a mentor button. Uh, you go in there, you can choose your mentor by reading uh, their bios or just put in your need and uh, one will be assigned to you. They usually get back to you within 48 hours. And uh, we would encourage you to do that. Uh, someone else uh, has asked a question. How does one create cash flow projection for prepaid services? Um, okay, so um, there, there's really two answers to that question. First of all, uh, if you get paid for prepaid services, it's cash and you identify it as cash. Uh, but it's important in your P&L to describe that as prepaid. You have not done the service. Uh, and depending upon how you want to use your accounting statement, those could be either uh, assets or liabilities and, and appear in your balance sheet. A liability would be that that uh, you, you haven't delivered the service, but you have the cash. And until you have delivered the service, uh, that that's a liability. 
uh, some accountants prefer that. Some accountants prefer to say see it as as a, a, a short term asset, but identified as a, a prepaid cash. Sorry to get into the details on that, but a cash flow statement it's cash that you get from an accounting statement. It appears in your balance sheet in one way or another. Got it. Uh, next question is: Please review the stats on goals such as gross profits uh, at 50% and other goals you discussed, I guess that's probably dependent on what industry you're in. Yeah, let me let me give you a brief uh, description of what that looks like. So in retail, the standard is usually 50%, which is to say, if you are buying, say, shoes from a shoe supplier, and you're offering them for sale, you should be charging twice as much for those shoes as for what you paid for them. Uh, now, that's not as easy as it sounds because you do have to play around with, with uh, how you price your stuff either at, at, for a particular segment or for a particular time. Uh, in other industries, it's very different. So in construction, where a lot of the costs are associated with projects, the gross margins are relatively low. They're in the 20 to 25% range. And that's because their administrative costs are also low. For people in the consulting business, those gross margins tend to be high in the 60 or 70% range, in part because uh, you have a, a, a lot of customer support, a lot of marketing costs, or whatever. Uh, I would urge you to uh, consult the RMA reference guide. You can go to any one of the libraries in uh, Fairfield County and ask them for that. And it's a huge book. You leaf through there by industry, by name of business, and you find the business that is described. And each one of those entries has the financials for businesses over a certain revenue amount, uh, uh, under a certain revenue revenue out and by quartiles, the best, the middle, and the worst of businesses, and what those metrics look like. That'll give you some idea of what your what your business is capable of doing, and that'll help you with pricing, and it'll help you with cost management. Got it. Uh, someone is uh, wondering whether you're still taking mentoring clients. Me personally? Yes. Sure. Okay, so you could probably just go to uh, fairfieldcounty.score.org and uh, select John if you wanted him to mentor you. Yeah, but you got to be nice to me. That's all I yeah. ask. Okay. Let's see if we got any in your Q&A. Uh, one person wanted to know what your specialty was. My specialty, you mean before I became a mentor? I guess. What's your, yeah, what do you uh, Marketing. Well, I was uh, all over the place. So I started in sales. I worked for Eastman Kodak Company and for Pitney Bowes, and I started in sales and sales management. Uh, I was uh, in the service division within Kodak, and I was uh, had a marketing job there. I did a stint as a quality uh, consultant for Eastman Kodak, uh, helping businesses uh, understand uh, how they could deliver higher quality to their business at, at, at greater profitability and they lent me out to other community partners so i provided advice to school districts uh, local governments hospitals that sort of thing and then uh, for about half of my uh, of my business career i was in strategic planning mergers and acquisitions uh, new business development so it's a checkered past i hope that answers your question Okay, great. Uh, so one question we had, a, 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 the person didn't understand the 2018 P&L stuff. Uh, why that year? I guess that's just an oh, old slide, right? It's an old, it's an old slide. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I, I did a picture of these things. And frankly, for me to go find the original and redo the picture was, I'm sorry, I'm a, I'm a volunteer. So, so I decided not to do that. Right. So, so if you're doing it now, you would be 2023 and 2024. And exactly. Exactly. Thank you for right. pointing that out. I'm sorry for being so lazy. <laughs> right. 
Right. Um, one individual is asking, should we price as starting at versus the actual price in this day and age where there are so many issues with people speaking about coaching, consulting business? I'm not sure I understand the question. Yeah. Should we price this starting price versus actual price? I guess the. Uh, Look, um, so if you if you're in the service business and this it's, it's really depends on the kind of business, there are generally ways to find out what a standard hourly or daily rate is. So as an example, and these are just examples, I don't mean this to just this, this is the way you ought to price yourself. But bookkeepers generally charge in the $50 an hour range. Accountants usually a charge in the $200 range. If you're a consultant, uh, you, you might want to charge as much as, say, $1,000 to a $1,500 a day, depending upon whether you're trying to serve a, a commercial client. Or if you're trying to serve personal clients, individuals, you may want to price at the $100 level. All I'm suggesting is it, it varies by type of service. And it varies by industry. The best thing you can do is to Google what's the price of a what's a, of a of a business management consulting service, or what's the price of uh, an attorney service, or or what's the price of personal counseling, and you can come up with some good indicators of what the standard industry price is. I wouldn't go much below that. Uh, at least to publicize the price, uh, I should say to market yourself with respect to that price, recognizing that for initial customers, you may want to go that go below that just to attract the business, but don't make it a habit because it's always easier to lower your price and very difficult to increase your price. Right. Uh, one individual wanted you to repeat the uh, the information at the library uh, the the for for price guidance. I think you said R and A or something uh, like R, that. Yes, uh, uh, yes. Resource Management Association Reference Guide R M A. Every library, most every library has it. It's a big, thick manual listing every business in the United States and the financials associated with these businesses. Now, not every business in the world provides this information, but some do. Uh, they'll provide it uh, to the RMA. The RMA publishes it. Uh, I think the RMA updates itself every three or four years. So what you may see is a couple of years old, but for your purposes, it is fine. It is a great way to understand the standard uh, figures associated with financials in business. Right. You know, and I'll even echo that. I had a client once that was interested in a pizza place in uh, Stratford. Uh, we just from home during COVID uh, logged on to our local library site and uh, using your library card, you can sign on and open up a, a site that's called Reference USA, which also gives a lot of valuable data. Uh, and instantly find out that there's 39 pizza places in, in Stratford. And uh, he was off doing his research, uh, going to his potential competitors and so forth. So there is a lot of information available uh, to your local library. We've always leaned on the business librarians and uh, we continue to uh, encourage that. Okay, I think that's all the time we have for questions. As a reminder, recording of the webinar, it will be available within the next day or so on our website under on-demand webinars. Again, SCORE offers free individual counseling, so please use the link on the screen or visit our website and cl click request a mentor. Also, please fill in the evaluation forms which have been sent at the end of the webinar. On behalf of SCORE, I'd like to thank you all for attending today's live webinar. In closing today, a big thank you to John Harmon for presenting today. And thanks again and enjoy the rest of your day.